We're ready for Exodus chapter 16, and today is Friday, so uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover, but uh, I'd also like to follow up. Someone had contacted me, not a member of our church, but who's following along on the Bible study, and had asked why I don't wear a collar. So I decided for the benefit of that person and those of you who know me, I would wear a collar. That will mean taking off my jacket because it's getting warm for me anyway. And putting on my collar. Today let's look at uh, Exodus chapter 16. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, guide us as we struggle with uh, many of the, the same troubles that Israel had, especially troubles of doubt and belief. Amen. Turn, if you will, in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 16, and let's try and cover this all uh, within our time limit, starting with verses 1 to 3. And notice uh, I put a little map below of uh, where they have to follow their... Uh, Basically, down in, in, you can see the, 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 the town of Elam. But if you follow the map down, there's a little, uh, it looks like a green tree. Uh, it's an oasis. That's where they're at. And they're, they're going to have to head out from there. Uh, verses 1 to 3. They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai in the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by, uh, by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Israel is not a very grateful group of people. This is the 15th day of the second month, which would have been like a full four weeks after their deliverance from slavery in Egypt. Um, and what's going on now is they're already complaining. They're grumbling. Moses and Aaron saw that uh, uh, where they came from and where they were going was worthwhile, but the people themselves could only live in the present moment, and the present moment was unpleasant. They didn't have that bigger perspective. Uh, how often do we sometimes lose sight in that larger perspective, and we get totally wrapped up in the discomfort of the moment and forget that God really has a plan in sight? Uh, looking at verse 3, we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full in Egypt. That never happened. Uh, in Egypt, they were slaves and slave people very seldom were given meat to eat. And they certainly didn't have a lot of time to sit down and enjoy a feast. They were romanticizing the past. Let's move on to verses four through five. Then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. This, of course, is the introduction to uh, what is famously known as uh, the manna or God's bread from heaven. I think it's uh, astonishing that these people are griping and complaining so much, and God simply responds with kindness. You're hungry, I'll take care of you. It's a test, a test to teach these people to depend on God, a test that will teach them to obey God, and a test that will give them a sense of discipline by having to pay attention to how much they gather, and once a week gathering twice as much. Uh, so God is occupying these people and, and preparing them for their future life in the promised land. We move on to verses 6 through 8. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. 
for what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you shall grumble against him. And then he again interjects, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. God has heard the grumbling against the Lord. They didn't think they were grumbling against God. They thought that they were expressing their own dismay and discomfort. But there's a way to do that. And it, it never occurred to them that maybe they could go to the Lord in prayer and simply say, Lord, we're hungry, we're frightened. Can you take care of us? No, it had to be grumbling right away. Moses says twice, what are we? That is, who, who are Moses and Aaron? that you're bringing your complaint to us. It's really God that you're offending, Moses is trying to tell the people. Nevertheless, evening and morning, you will be fed. Uh, this evening meat, this is the first reference to the fact that God would provide meat. Um, uh, and in the morning, there will be bread to the full. Let's go on. Oh, before we do, uh, what I pictured there is what the manna might look like on the ground. I've got a feeling that's a picture of snow, but that's what manna would have looked like. Verses 9 through 14. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quail came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, uh, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. These quail that came up, again, are a natural occurrence. Quail are a type of low-flying bird and good eating uh, that migrate from southern Europe to Arabia by way of the Sinai Peninsula. They come in huge flocks. They tend to nest in bushes or on the ground. And if they're exhausted from their migration, it's very hard for them to take flight again. So they're easy to catch and kill. Um, this, this fine flake-like thing was, of course, the manna. It was white. It's been described as being pearl-like in color. Uh, when raked off the ground, it could be gathered and, and used uh, as, as a type of dough to make bread, cakes, uh, any number of, of types of things. And as we'll see in the verses ahead, it has a sweet honey-like taste to it. Let's read verses 15 through 19. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall take one omer, according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over. And whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, leave no one or let no one leave any of it over till the morning. We see that the amount they were to take was an omer. Nobody knows what an omer is. It's a unit of measurement, but what it means has changed over the years. So it's somewhere between a cup and a gallon. Good luck figuring that out. What we do know is it was enough to feed the person. Uh, and, and it was an omer for each of the persons that live in your tent. Each family was to take care of itself. And they were not just taking handouts from God. They had to participate. You couldn't, as a rich person, hire someone else to do the work for you. You couldn't, as a poor person, hire yourself out and do twice the work in order to get something else. Everyone in this camp of Israel 
was to carry their own weight and take care of whoever was in their tent. And as a result, afterwards, uh, down in verse 18, there was nothing left over. Uh, and, and those who gathered little, they lacked nothing. God made sure to a person that they were well fed and taken care of. In other words, God was involved, but he assisted them in their work. We still teach this in, in the catechism when we, we talk about how does God provide for us. He gives us everything we need. Along with that, he gives us the ability to work in order to also provide for ourselves. God is present in both. Moving on to verses 20 and 21. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stink. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could, but when the sun grew hot, it melted. The people did not listen. They just didn't believe God. And what is it in us that when a rule is laid down, we just have to test the rules to see if they're real and if they will be enforced. Well, in this case, they were enforced. It bred worms and it stank. It, it, the Hebrews had this special aversion uh, to things that smelled bad. And so God used smell to dissuade them. Jewish tradition, in fact, has many different stories and ideas about how the, the, the children of Israel managed to get this manna up off the, the ground without bringing dust with it. And there's all sorts of fanciful tales because the idea of eating food with dirt mixed in was simply too much for them. Uh, we're not given the details, but it's interesting that to this day, Jewish people, that matters to them. Uh, what we do know is whatever was not gathered melted. God wants us to depend on him day by day. We don't gather up ahead of time uh, for the future. Actually, we do. We call it uh, an IRA. <laughs> uh, but God says, don't, don't trust in your work for tomorrow more than you trust in me. And this is why we pray in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, because we trust in God every day. Moving on to verses 22 through 30. On the sixth day, they gather, gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. And all that is left over lay aside to be kept till the morning. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them. And it did not stink and there were no worms in it. Moses said, eat it today, for today is the Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather. They were so disobedient, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Sit, notice again in verse 28, Moses is the stand-in for Israel. God speaks to Moses the way he speaks to Israel. Israel disobeyed, so God scolds Moses. How long will you, Moses, no, actually Israel, refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Here, God lays out for the first time the concept of the Sabbath, a day that God imposed rest on his people so that they would not burn themselves out. Uh, and he gave them double portions, which just means Sundays really are a day for eating leftovers. Some of these people, they went out to gather any extra anyway on, on Sunday, and uh, they just wouldn't believe God. And there are still people that won't believe God today. They won't give a portion of their time to God. And for that matter, they won't give a portion of their time to rest and to re recuperate. 
But God gives us the Sabbath, and it's not meant for us to please God. This particular commandment is meant for our good. In fact, Jesus would one day have to argue because he was accused of breaking the Sabbath. He would have to say in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So God is trying to impose some, some type of, of rest on his people. It's interesting. We train animals with food. God is training Israel with food. Verses 31 through 36. Now the house of Israel called its name manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations so that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Before we go on, we see a description here. It was like wafers made with honey. It was good tasting food that God gave them. And it could be molded and shaped into all sorts of forms. It could be baked, it could be boiled, but it, it, it could be made into cake and into breads. And, and so just think of eating donuts and cake at every meal for the next 40 years and finding that it is healthy and good for you. This is what God did for Israel. We're picking up with 33. And Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. Now God is saying, we're going to keep some of this as proof against the future that this stuff really existed. 34, and the Lord commanded Moses, so, so Aaron placed it uh, before the testimony to be kept. And the people of Israel ate the manna 40 years till they came to a habitable land. They ate the manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan. An omer is a tenth part of an ephah. I don't find that helpful at all. But they ate the manna until they came to the promised land. God never meant for it to be permanent. Once they got to the land of promise, God wanted them to once again start working, working, and he would work with them for their food. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed hearing it from a, a man with a collar, even if it was uh, on his head. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, you command us to serve you, but sometimes we forget you also command us to rest and to take care of ourselves. Uh, you lead us in ways that we so often forget to or don't want to follow. And yet as you train us and make us more obedient to you, it can only be for your glory and for our well-being. Guide us and lead us for the rest of this day to follow in your footsteps and be your obedient servants. Amen. See you next time.